Welcome to Join the Conversation. And I am thrilled that you are with us from New York, London and Israel, and in fact, from many countries all over the world. My name is Caroline Shapiro, and I'm the Director of International Public Relations at the Tower of David Museum. I'm suggesting that you turn your Zoom settings to speak with you and keep your microphones on mute until after the presentations. Please do keep your questions in mind or add them to the chat during the conversation as the speakers are ready to answer your questions. Today, we are going to be reimagining the museums of the 21st century. We have three outstanding directors who will be talking about the challenges of renewal. Elac Lieber, Director and Chief Curator of the Tower of David Museum. Hi, Elac. And we have with us Sharon Ament, Director of, of, of the Museum of London. Hello, good and, evening, everybody. And Whitney Donhauser, President and Renee Manchel, Director of the Museum of the City of New York. Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be joining you from New York. All three museums address the history of these remarkable cities. The histories that for many generations were written by men. Today, the creative forces who are striving to include the diverse narratives of our cities are these three accomplished women, Elat, Sharon and Whitney. The Museum of the City of New York was founded in 1923. The Museum of London was founded in 1976. And the newest kid on the block is the Tower of David Museum, founded in 1989, albeit in the oldest museum setting, an ancient citadel that has guarded Jerusalem in parts for hundreds of years and in parts for thousands of years. Even when the Tower of David Museum was founded, only 30 years ago, museums were still the primary place where visitors could go and see with their own eyes relics from the past and curated stories of interest and knowledge. Today, however, technology has enabled us to access pictures and information ourselves from our own homes. And these past 12 months, that couldn't be truer. So as we discuss the renewal process of museums, the role of the museum is just one of the challenges that these directors all face when reimagining their institutions. Before we begin our conversation, let's take a look at the three museums. And we'll start with our host, Elat Lieber and the Tower of David Museum. Elat Lieber has been the director and chief curator of the Tower of David Museum for the past eight years. She is also the chair of the Jerusalem Forum for Cultural Institutions. Elat's romance with the ancient stones of Jerusalem Citadel actually started Mac much earlier when she headed up the education department of the Tower of David for over a decade from 1990 until 2001. In the intermittent years, Eilat initiated and directed the restoration of the home of Israel's first Nobel laureate, Shai Agnon, turning a dilapidated building into a beautifully restored and preserved museum with Shai Agnon's original library. Since 2012, Elat has been the driving force behind the changing image of the Tower of David Museum. She has taken this national heritage site and the Museum of the History of the City of Jerusalem and has also made it a leading cultural institution and the platform for contemporary expression of art and design in Jerusalem. And as a result of dynamic changing exhibitions, creative programming, the creation of an innovation lab, a vibrant education department, and a leading program of, for inclusion in museums in Israel, visitor attendance has doubled. She is now leading the renewal and conservation of the Tower of David Museum. Elat. Thank you so much, Caroline. And thank you, Sharon and Whitney for joining us. And of course, thank you all for joining this conversation this evening. As Caroline just said, the Tower of David Museum uh, funded in 1989 under the vision of the legendary mayor of Jerusalem, Teddy Kolek, who wanted a special museum to the story of the city, 4,000 years of rich history. 
Here you can see the citadel located in the highest point of the historic city on the western hill of ancient Jerusalem. You can see Jaffa Gate, the main gate to the old city, and the most important sites of the old city, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at the Christian Quarter, the Dome of the Rock, and the Kotel, the Western Wall. Here you can see the highest part of the citadel, the Herodian Tower, the beautiful view from the top of the, this tower gives the visitor the most beautiful view of Jerusalem from the east, the eastern part, the ancient part, to the west, the modern part. This is the real bridge between the two cities, east and west, the real bridge between communities in the city. And that's why the Tower of David Museum became the gateway to Jerusalem. Here you can see the archaeological garden of the museum and the original guard rooms of this citadel became the galleries of the historical museum. As I said, together with the history of Jerusalem, um, the Tower of David deals with the story of Jerusalem. And to enrich this story, um, the museum actually shows contemporary exhibitions in many aspects of the history of the city, it's culture, food, fashion, design, art, people, communities, etc. Jerusalem is a very unique city, as you know, and of course, because of this rich history and the significance of the city to the three monotheistic religions. Together with exhibition, the museum actually is a platform for unique cultural activities and events and of course tell the story with the beautiful amazing nice spectacular that um, actually opened to the public 10 years ago and tell this rich history in a different and um, an amazing way by using um, projection music and images and brings this to a very popular um, show that uh, actually millions of visitors came already to see it from all over the world. Here you can see the Jaffa Gate, the main entrance to the old city of Jerusalem. And you can see why the Tower of David is actually the real bridge between two parts of the city. In the past eight or uh, 10 years, I can say that the area surrounds the Tower of David became a very popular commercial area in an ancient neighborhood of the city called Mamila. This is the most popular um, shopping mall of the city. Um, and of course, many visitors from all over the world are coming to see the old city of Jerusalem are spending their time and money in this area. And Actually, after um, I think uh, the beginning of this century, 10 years of not very simple uh, years, we, we actually experienced terror in Jerusalem. Um, this mall, this area, this commercial area became a very successful and a meeting point from, for people from all the communities of the city. And uh, you can see workers and clients and tourists together from, as I said, all the neighborhoods and parts of the city, Christians, Muslims, um, Israelis, all um, sectors like uh, ultra-Orthodox, secular, and how can we know? Because in Jerusalem, the customs of the people tells a lot about them. So here we can see um, the um, eastern uh, gate of the citadel. You have to know that the citadel was built, most of it during the 16th century, where when the city uh, was only the city inside the city walls, like one square kilometer. And of course, the, the citadel related to the ancient city, but now um, the citadel stands with the back 
to the heart of Jerusalem. And we wanted to welcome the visitors from the, the west side. That's why we decided in our upgrade project, in our renovation project, to change the circulation to the museum and to welcome the visitors from the west, from the new area, the touristic um, commercial area in, uh, in the west, and to be the real gateway to the city, to enter from the west and after um, visiting the galleries and understand the history and the story of Jerusalem, to be able to visit the old city of Jerusalem with a lot of new knowledge and understanding. So our new entrance pavilion to the museum, we located right here in front of uh, the Jaffa Gate Square, as I said, the place where all the tourists and visitors are gathering before entering to the city. Now, here we can show how we can actually take a very neglected and kind of a black hole area, but very important from an archaeological point of view to be a new section of the museum. As you know, that Old City is an archaeological area where we cannot actually think about a new building, but here we are going to use this archaeological area to be our new educational wing um, to actually um, um, and build our um, upcoming future work with school children, students, and of course, um, be able to develop our educational um, activities. Here you can see um, our new excavation site. Um, this is the area of, of the new of the new entrance pavilion. You can see it's a very modest building, of course, um, um, because of uh, the importance of, of the ancient and heritage building and it's going to be most of it with the glass and that visitors will be able to see the beauty of, of the of the original building. Uh, we are going to have a new contemporary uh, gallery here as I said Jerusalem is much more than archaeology and um, and history. It's an inspiration for many artists from all over the world and we got, we're going to have this new gallery. And this is our new archaeological um, wing. They call it Kishle. It used to be a prison during the British mandate. And here we are going to use technology to tell the story of the site. Um, it was part of the Herodian palace during the Roman period by using technology the technological uh, equipment and media, we are going to tell the story of this site in a very um, different way. We are going to show how archaeology is uh, part of the historical story. And here we can have a chance to look at the future of the museum. Um, this is going to be a different museum. Um, since um, during the 80s, when the museum was funded, it was not based on any collection. The only original part in the museum was the citadel itself. Um, but today, in the fourth uh, hour time, uh, um, the story is the same story, but we are going to use remains, originals to tell the story because we want uh, that our visitors will be able to feel and touch the past together with um, traditional uh, exhibits and display, and of course technology. But um, this is going to be a real museum with a new collection of, of course, remains and artifacts from the citadel itself and from Jerusalem. And together with, of course, um, uh, ex displays and, and exhibitions, that tells the modern story of Jerusalem by using photographs and other collections. And 
here um, you can see the new square of, of our um, a new entrance area. And we hope to be able to open this um, update and uh, preserve museum um, next uh, spring, summer. So um, um, we're looking forward to see you in Jerusalem and welcome you um, soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elat. Uh, I'm going to ask the director of the Museum of London, Sharon Ament, uh, to present the museum next. Uh, the Museum of London is in the process of creating a new museum for London, moving to Smithville Market. Sharon joined the museum in 2012, and during that time, the annual visitor numbers have now reached 1 million. This has been achieved through a program of successful exhibitions, and the museum has engaged more school children than ever and is experimenting wildly with all things digital. During Sharon's tenure, the museum has acquired both its largest objects, the, not, the Donald Trump baby limp, which flew over Parliament Square during the US president's visit to the UK, as well as a fatberg found in the London sewage system at Whitechapel. Sharon is a cultural ambassador for the mayor of London and member of the mayor's cultural leadership board and she's on the London Area, Area Council of Arts Council England. She's the chair of the London Screen Archives and co-chair of the Women Leaders in Museums Network. Sharon is a key voice in nurturing the development of the cultural mile in London, and I'm sure she'll tell us a little bit about that shortly. Um, she's also the Noyce Leadership Fellow, a member of the Conseil Scientifique of Universe Science in Paris, and on the International Advisory Board of the Art Science Museum in Singapore. Sharon, we'd love to know more about the Museum of London. Thank you very much, and I now know why I'm so tired after you've read out all the things that I do. I really am. So let me share my screen and I'm going to tell you all about our project. It's okay, right, so I'm going to tell you about the New Museum for London, and as, um, as uh, Caroline talked about, you know, our museum, as the Museum of London, was founded in 1976, but we came together from two much older museums. It, in... I'm trying to get my screen to move on. Oh, do we me? Why is that not moving? Um, excuse me. Um, let's see. This ah, oh, that's right. So in 2015, um, in 2015, the uh, uh, Grayson Perry artist here um, uh, announced that is well well-known artist announced that the Museum of London would move to a place called Smithfield. It is it is only ten minutes from where I am sitting now in London Wall, but it feels like a new planet. I'm sitting in the central business district in the Museum of London. Ten minutes away is a vibrant twenty-four hour wholesale meat market. Um, with a derelict building at the end. And this is what our new museum will look like from the air when we open in 2005. So we will be inhabiting a Victorian meat market. And it overcomes a big issue that we currently live with. Um, this is what was said the day before we opened uh, our museum. Unfortunately, I think we're in the most inaccessible museum in the whole wide world. If you want to know where I'm sitting, if you look at the words Museum of London, I am just sitting in that office above the word London. Goodness knows in 1976 who thought of building a museum that had no entrance. We're a bit better than that today, but it's still not good enough. So we are moving to this place and, it, and the re, how it all stacks up economically is that our, the building, the place that I'm sitting in now, being in the central business district is worth a lot of money. So in me taking our organization and shifting to this new site in West Smithfield, I will be releasing the value of the London Wall site, which adds and is the foundation 
for the funding of this new building. So there we have our um, objectives for the new site. And what we're finding is that a market, which is built in the late Victorian period, and here's some early pictures of it, and here it is in the 1960s, makes an absolutely fantastic museum. Um, not as old as the Tower uh, of uh, David in Jerusalem, of course, but its roots go back to, uh, certainly this, uh, this was the site of, um, of, the, uh, of Roman graves when uh, the Romans uh, set up London, then called Londinium. So it's a hugely vibrant and evocative building. And this is it today. It's not been used for 30 years. It's decrepit. There's lots of problems with water ingress and we're busy working on it now. It looks, it looked like this in 2017. Now it's a construction site. And throughout the whole of the pandemic, our uh, builders have been working to, on the project to start the construction. This is what we are here for as a museum. We're here to enrich the understanding and appreciation of London and all its people, past, present and future. And importantly, in doing this, we aspire to be a force for good. And I think that's a really important and big transformation for the museum to actually declare it, is go it wants to be a force for good as London, uh, in London as, it, as London must be for the world. So a bit of a challenge to our own dear city to be a force for good. So I think we're taking a lot on our shoulders here. And with the Museum of London and our new uh, site, we want to be London's shared place, really slap bang in the middle of it all. And we take share, sharing to be very important. In developing a new museum for a city, uh, we're looking at three dimensions. Time, London's development over time, place, of course, London itself, but London is a global city, so it's London and the world and people. People who are born in London and people who have arrived in London and people who have left London. So people make a city. In the buildings, we have used the temporal uh, aspect to organize our galleries. And here's just a schema of all of the different um, different parts of the museum. And yes, we do have a railway line running through our galleries. Oh, sorry, I'm going back in the wrong way. And this is what those spaces will act are actually being visualized as. Galleries, welcoming spaces, um, eating spaces, research centers, dynamic collections, and much, much more. The project has eight eight objectives. I am not going to go through all of those um, and people can read these at their own leisure, but it really is about creating a sustainable museum and one which is connected and meaningful to people. Our design team is here, Paul Williams, Asif Khan and Julian Harrop. Um, they are London born and bred and we have been working with this team since uh, 2017. We've been picking over the building and we've been working with Londoners and our objective has been to engage 100,000 Londoners. That's Husseina, that's Clara, that's Hugo and many, many more. And we're doing this in really innovative ways with the market traders themselves. There is still a live, uh, there is still a meat market as part of the complex that we will be sitting beside. So this is not a this is not a scheme where you take uh, you you impose on a on a historic set of buildings big bombastic architecture. We have been disinterring this space and looking at all of the possibilities of a, of the market and saying how does it best work as a museum. We've been looking. We've that's made design decisions. So our big narrative galleries are in what's called past time in the basement of the general market. And they're plotted something like this. The, the ground floor spaces are really evocative. We're opening it all up. 
and we're leaving the traces of the heritage and history of the market itself there. That's really important to us. We, we deeply care about how this building was used in the past and how it came to be. And this is a visual um, of what we call our time. So this is where we will explore London from 1945 to today. It will be a very imaginative, interactive space. It will bust through the walls and create big engagement with the city and the streets itself. Across the road in the poultry market, which we will still call the poultry market, we have our special exhibitions ga gallery, which is contemporary time. And on top of that, we have this new gallery called Future Time and Imagine Time. So London, that dimension of time goes into the future. And London is about many, many possibilities. You know, on, in, in Imagine Time, you could imagine putting all of the architectural uh, 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 models that have ever been developed about London, the ones that worked and the ones that never came off. We can go deep into the basements here and look at our interactive uh, galleries with, uh, which is Deep Time, which has all of our, uh, lots of our collections. As I said, the merger between, between the museum in the market and uh, the streets is really important. And it will enable us to do more of this. This is one of our exhibitions, a hugely interactive digital exhibition. It will enable us to show our fantastic objects, which we can only bring out now and again. We've got seven and a half million objects. This is something from our suffragette collection. It will enable us to put fat bergs on display. It will enable us to work with community projects. This is our dub reggae exhibition, which is on at the moment. It will enable us to be more topical, to bring forward topics that people care about. And people are telling us it's music, it's food, and it's sport, who'd have thought? But we have a deep archeological collection too. So we will be reinterpreting that in the modern context. And throughout all of this project since 2017, extraordinarily, we have been finding new spaces in this site that nobody knew about. New underground spaces and even new cocoa rooms. And there is a, an image of the Lockhart's cocoa rooms, which is an extraordinary thing. It was um, a, a somebody who was part of the um, temperance movement. Oh, I've gone dark, excuse me. Energy saving light, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, created a non-drinking cafe. We've got all these spaces around the museum which are part of the market and we want to use those and create co-working spaces with partners who are all about London. So it then brings a museum which is inside and outside, occupying all the streets and occupying those shops together. So we truly engage with London in, on the street and in the galleries, creating all sorts of new spaces in what is Culture Mile. And what we're finding is that by asking ourselves this question, how can we be more like London? We can delve deep into our past, such as here, we see Victorian images of how graphics was used across London and reimagine that in the modern context. So for us, we ask this question all the time, is this London? How can the Museum of London be more like London? And this is leading us to all sorts of exciting possibilities into late night openings um, and, to, and, and into real partnerships with organizations across the whole city. So we're changing this streetscape, which is what it's like currently, into that magnificent building that you can see. It's hugely exciting and a bit scary. <laughs> it sounds amazing. Sharon, when are you hoping to open? Uh, now, we've had a delay of a year because of COVID, so uh, 2025. Wow, how exciting. Well, that brings me to the um, other side of the ocean and uh, to introduce you to Whitney Donhauser. Uh, Whitney joined the Museum of the City of New York as President and Renee Menschel Director in January 2016.
Her appointment follows a 23-year career in the museum management of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. At the Museum of the City of New York, Whitney oversaw the final phase of the New York at its core, the permanent exhibition on the 400-year-old history of New York City. During her tenure, historic highs in museum and education program attendance have been achieved, as well as record numbers of online followers with the museum's first ever and ongoing multilingual advertising and out, uh, advertising campaign, which is drawing more and more diverse visitors. Innovative technology outreach and partnerships with Link NYC, WNET, and Urban Archive reach millions of people every day. From 2016 to 2020, Whitney represented the Manhattan Borough on the Cultural Institution Group, a consortium of 34 New York City museums, and she serves on the advisory committee for Link NYC. With the onset of the 2020 global pandemic, Whitney has navigated the museum through very challenging times to secure financial, ongoing financial stability and oversee significant staffing and programming changes. Whitney, we're excited to hear more about the Museum of the City of New York. Well, thank you so much for being here. And um, while it's fascinating that we are the oldest museum, I believe, but um, New York, of course, as an entity being incorporated is significantly younger by comparison to Jerusalem and of course, London. But of course, on a world stage, we are a powerhouse. So let me see if I can share my screen um, and I will go to the beginning. Um, so uh, I'm, and let's see if this, so this is our building here. Um, the museum certainly was created tradition in a traditional building. Um, this is our site on 103rd and 5th Avenue. We are located in East Harlem, but we are on the top of Museum Mile and just a short walking distance from the Guggenheim Museum and the Metropolitan Museum. So over the past few years, we've taken a very significant step of turning from really a somewhat sleepy museum to an energetic, innovative space and really looking at how and why people want to live and why they want to travel to New York. Um, this, we see ourselves um, very much in the vein of our international partners um, as a new type of city museum where we engage audiences in a spirited discussion about uh, of the present and what our future goals are for our society, um, while still being a venue for the display and preservation of art and artifacts. So um, we, this is a image of our uh, starlight chandelier, the modern chandelier, but it's very emblematic of our current identity with a mixture of the old and the new, the exciting and the dynamic. Um, here are some major milestones. We talked about the fact we were started, we were founded in 1923, but moved to our current site, which was built for us in 1932. For 10 years, we had a massive expansion and nearly a hundred million dollar renovation. Much of it came from the city of New York and then the rest from private sources. Um, in 2016, we opened up our historic exhibition on New York City history, New York at its core, which was something that we had been hoping to do since our very founding. Um, and in 2020, we've dealt with moving to an online version as a building that's had to be closed. Um, so certainly I wanted to talk a little bit about our major project that has was underway, New York at its core, starting in 2016. We really tried to attract a younger and a more diverse audience. Um, and not necessarily be about the display of precious objects, but to really talk about um, telling amazing New York stories. Um, so this was our first, this is the only permanent exhibition on New York City history that exists in New York. Um, it was five years in the making um, and has become a major destination and tourist attraction. So uh, we say that there are four characteristics that make New York uniquely the city that it is. Money, diversity, density, and creativity. And we explore this in three galleries on our main floor. I'll show you the three galleries. Um, Port City, which is from 1609 to 1898. We have um, a beautiful array of objects and um, uh, kios uh, kiosks that we call them with uh, 35 lesser known and um, well-known New York City 
people, from everyone from Alexander Hamilton, um, but then uh, Jeannie June, who is a transgender person in the Gilded Age. So um, we've, this is uh, very popular with lots of school groups, um, and it's great because along the sides, which you can't see, we do have beautiful jewel-like cases with gorgeous objects. In um, total, there's 400 objects that are in the total uh, exhibition. This is our world city where we um, show really the 20th century going right up to Superstore Standy. Um, and we talk about um, how New York changed in the 20th century. We explore in these mesh screens in the center, building up, stepping out, street life, making a living and getting around. And we also have in the back people interactives um, where we show people, um, again, who are not necessarily um, the most uh, well-known New Yorkers of the 20th century, but people who give us an opportunity to tell incredible stories. So we do have famous people like Supreme Court um, Justice Sonia Sotomayor but, and Jay-Z is someone who's in there, but also someone called AJ Goja who has a um, taxi cab business. Um, and so he shares uh, with that. Um, then we also have a future city lab where we explore um, our aspirations of where the city's going, but also look at the challenges related to housing, population, um, diversity, transportation, and climate change. So um, the, we have been dealing with the impact of COVID. We closed in March of 2020, reopening in August of um, August 27th in 2020. Um, the impact, of course, has been huge, but we see very importantly our role as New York City storyteller being very vital right now. Um, so we have increased a huge amount of online programming. Um, you can see here that we dealt with the issues of policing and race. We were able to do some movies outside on our terrace, which was fantastic. We also launched a digital hub. Um, so all of our digital assets were, um, people were able to find them easily on our website. Um, we have done a lot of exhibitions on current events. This is something on Jacob Rees who was really the first photojournalist that documented poverty um, uh, in New York. And then um, something on the importance of being counted in the census in New York. Um, we have most recently um, opened this fall uh, an exhibition that's both online and actually uh, on site, which is called New York Responds, where we had community jurists who selected the objects from the, for this exhibition. We over had over 20,000 objects selected. Um, and it was uh, a very fun moment for us, but also very um, challenging on how to document something that is so close to us and how to document um, the uh, nature of the, um, the pandemic, but also the protests around social justice. Um, so we, this is a look of the 12 jurists who came from many different aspects of New York, which was a very exciting moment for us to be able to have them select the objects and work closely with our curators. Um, coming up, we have an exhibition which we think will be the perfect um, way of celebrating New York as it comes out of the pandemic, which is New York New Sounds. This is um, an exhibition uh, that will cover the music of the 80s. We think of the 70s as a moment when New York was in crisis um, and at a time when New York was seen as very grim. We think that um, it's exciting for New Yorkers to think about how New York pivoted and the creativity that came post the 1970s and the 80s with a uh, merger of uptown and downtown sounds. And we think this will be very um, mo moving and meaningful for people as we look forward to New York moving past the pandemic. Um, we're excited to be able to sell, uh, celebrate our centennial in uh, 2023. So we are planning um, major exhibition and uh, programming right now um, as we get, look forward to being able to talk about New York's resilience and its ability to come back out of uh, these sort of dire moments um, and be able to celebrate what that looks like. So I hope now I will be able to share with you a video. Be able to share with you a video. New York right. City is unlike anywhere else in the world. And the Museum of the City of New York, located at the top of Museum Mile in East Harlem, is the place to celebrate the city by exploring its past and present and imagining its future. Whether you are a New Yorker or a New Yorker at heart, this is your museum. People have been coming to New York City in search of freedom and opportunity for over 400 years 
because the city has been a beacon of human endeavor throughout its history. Since its days as a striving Dutch village to its role today as the capital of the modern world, our museum shows how our city has often led the country forward by welcoming and celebrating the diversity and creativity that make New York, New York. Telling New York's story is now more important than ever. Our exhibitions and collections, our programs and celebrations for New Yorkers of all ages, and our education initiatives, including free field trips for some of the city's most underserved public schools, help bring that story to life. We have been the Museum of the City of New York for nearly 100 years, and we have never been more excited to honor what New York City means to its residents and visitors from around the world. A place that embraces ideas, fosters innovation, and inspires conversation. Explore our city's past, celebrate its present, and imagine its future. I will stop sharing. Well, thank you so much, both Whitney and Sharon. I don't know about anyone else here, but I am so excited uh, to think about traveling becoming easier and coming back, and that we'll be able to go to visit London and New York, and hopefully you'll be able to come to us soon as well. Um, you mentioned uh, the response of the Museum of the City of New York, Whitney, to COVID. Um, and I was wanting to hear a little bit more from Sharon and Delat as well as to, uh, and also Whitney, uh, you know, if you want to add something, um, as you look forward to the future and the museum uh, that you're creating uh, with regards to design of exhibitions or programming or visitor flow uh, in light of COVID, are the, how has it impacted that those kind of decision makings. And we've all learned to go digital and to go uh, bring virtual programming to our visitors, uh, which has been a fantastic way of meeting people. We wouldn't have done this probably um, had it have been 18 months ago. So do you think that the digital programming side that you've all done in the museums will be something that you continue? Um, Sharon. Let's start with you. Okay, I think, well, it's certainly been a huge learning curve and it's been exciting and lots of things have worked. Some things have been really unexpected and some things haven't worked at all. And um, what we know, what I have found is that it's, can, the digital really works when it's rooted in the museum itself. So something that has been a huge ex, uh, effective has been, whilst we've been in lockdown, a curator, um, uh, working with schools and doing live broadcasts into schools through the web on the Fire of London, for instance. We did three of these and it's had 40,000 um, viewers, uh, people engaging with it, which is really great. Um, you know, there's been all sorts of stuff we've done on social media. Um, again, if it, it's about certainly about the collections and certainly curator led and expert led, then I think that really has, that's brought, you know, been uh, fantastic. One of the things we have found though, whilst in the UK, whilst everybody started to do homeschooling and using museum resources online, there's a group of people who are excluded from the digital world. Imagine a household which might have only one mobile phone and that one mobile phone has to provide access for school for school children or whatever it's extraordinary so we started um, with our colleagues in culture mile producing activity packs and uh, so doing uh, and these were distributed through food banks and through community outreach centers so we suddenly became aware of many young people and families who were digitally excluded because of their poverty. And that's something we will really work hard on in the future. How amazing. Wow, that's fantastic. Elat, um, digital programming, the thought you're, you're in the middle of actually, you know, the, the design process of the new museum. Are there different aspects that, 
that you are now rethinking um, or including in a different way due to COVID? Um, yes, of course. So this year was a great opportunity for us to develop our digital program and of course to create a virtual tours and, and content about the history of Jerusalem uh, to enrich um, the, the story and to host many experts uh, from the Hebrew University, for example, and we could collaborate with uh, um, I think the academic um, um, world of, of Jerusalem it was very important for the Tower of David Museum. Um, and of course, we will continue uh, in this um, um, digital uh, program because um, it, it's, it's not, of course, going to stop, although um, the COVID in, in Israel is, um, is about to recover, I, I believe. Um, so the future is also there, but of course, uh, we are not going to, uh, I think, replace the real uh, experience of visit the site, the archaeology, touch the history and enjoy our new uh, exhibition. And of course, um, we had a lot of uh, uh, thoughts about our new exhibition and how we are going to avoid actually um, situation of, you know, um, touching screens and using earphones and headsets. Um, so we had to change uh, some of our, our plans for the future by um, using personal equipment, uh, by thinking how actually um, we can build an interactive exhibition, but uh, without the need to touch every button or every screen. It's, uh, it's very challenging, uh, but I believe um, we will be able to um, actually um, be safe and, and be innovative um, and creative. Thank you, Elat. Whitney. Um, you talked about what you did during your time in your presentation, but moving forward, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, um, you know, when we first started through this whole process, um, we have learned a lot and we um, sort of were a little more grassroots in how we presented ourselves digitally and on Zoom calls. And I think as we um, move forward in the next uh, years coming, um, we know that digital is going to stay but we're looking to um, kind of polish ourselves up and make sure that uh, things, uh, that we use technology in a smarter way, that we um, think about how to continue to refine um, and improve what we're doing. But we know that New York City school kids who have been really challenged during these times um, probably won't be able to go on field trips um, externally and that we will continue to be delivering field trips to the classroom um, in the next year because um, we know that that time is precious and that when all the learning will be in the classroom. Um, so we um, think about being able to um, just move forward, but digital is going to be around for a while and how we um, how we incorporate it into all of our programs. I think an online exhibition as well as something um, in our building is also something that will continue for every exhibition because we have the ability to use QR codes to translate into different languages, to have people with um, uh, vision of problems to be able to put it into bigger um, text. So there's a lot of benefits that are coming out of what we've learned through COVID. Um, I've just had a question here and I'm going to ask it because it's a good point in time. And, and to say to other people, if you do have questions, please do uh, send them in the chat. Um, Rotem wants to know, uh, what do you think will be your greatest challenge in the first post COVID year? Uh, Whitney, let's start with you. 
Our greatest challenge is knowing um, what our audience will look like when they come back and how big our audience will be. So um, I think the question, what is the new norm um, and what does that look like? We know that we um, you know, had hundreds of thousands of visitors, 60% who were domestic international tourists. Um, and when will the international tourists come back? When will the domestic tourists come back? And how do we program um, for those different audiences? So uh, we've had to learn to be really nimble and fast, which is hard for museums um, because usually it takes a lot of time in advanced planning. We like to put thought into our program and have things presented in a beautiful way, um, which take time. And so uh, we need to figure out how to speed things up, but still um, address what's happening now. And Sharon? What, what do you think your challenge will be? Certainly all of us, absolutely the same as Whitney around audiences, visitors and their appetite for engaging in social spaces again. Uh, you know, don't forget in London, in the UK, we've been locked down in our rooms. It's, this is the first time I've been in the museum um, since November. Um, however, uh, I, the other, apart from financial stability, um, I'm in the middle of building a new museum. So keeping the contractors on site and to program when they are working under COVID um, health and safety regulations is, is, is an interesting and difficult task. Uh, keeping the every, all the designers working remotely has been extraordinary. Um, I think there's upsides to it and downsides, but keeping that program on track is really critical for me. Thank you. Eilat, what would you say the, the first challenges uh, coming um, out of COVID? Yes, um, I, I have to tell the truth and say that for the Tower of David Museum, the financial um, challenge is going to be the main because um, um, it's already based on self-income, and uh, Jerusalem, uh, as as um, there, you know, a holy city, an important city for so many people from all over the world. Uh, Jerusalem economy based on on tourism. Uh, only twenty percent from the visitors to Jerusalem are tourists from all over the world. So this is going to be a great challenge for Jerusalem and for the Tower of David Museum in um, this year and, and the next year. We can't hear you. Mute, here we go, sorry. Sorry for that. These three museums tell the stories of the three most exciting and well-known cities in the world. And I want to ask the directors um, just to give us a, a little uh, insight as to city museums. So what do you think the role of your museum is? What impact does the city itself have, the, have on the role of the museum? And what is the relationship between a city and a city museum. So just a, a few words because it's unlike any other museum that there is. Um, Elat, let's start with you. <laughs> so um, the Tower of David um, Museum, um, as, as we know, is the story of Jerusalem and the location um, is perfect because the citadel represents all the layers from the history. And uh, we must um, find a way to make the connection between the building and, and the remains to the story and exhibitions. And, and we have to find a way to make it actually un, um, understand for all. And um, I must say that uh, this is a universal museum, an inclusive museum, tell the three narratives of the city, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's a great challenge in Jerusalem and in the Israeli society today. And we are very proud to lead this message for um, the world and for, for Israelis. And it's going to be, um, I think, our main challenge in the future to tell this rich story and to bring communities from the city, not just tourists 
and to, of course, make um, this um, amazing place the real heart of, of Jerusalem, the real heart of, of the city and bridge between people. Thank you. Well, let's uh, travel uh, again to New York. Whitney. Well, I've been influenced by something that the head of the Smithsonian Museum has said, Lonnie Bunch, where he said that museums should not be community centers, but the center of the community. And I think that that's a really interesting idea because we have in our name of the city of New York. And that means that New York is a five borough city. We need to include all boroughs, not just Manhattan where we're based. And we need to include the different voices that make up the city. Um, and that's something that uh, we, have to um, proactively go out um, in order to bring those voices into the museum. I'm also curious about how we can get out into the city. Um, so we do have um, some digital materials on the Link NYC kiosk, which are basically on the sites of old phone booths with digital displays, where we show our historic images um, of buildings in nearby neighborhoods. They are geotagged so that, and we tell people about the history of things. So we're really going into their neighborhood and showing our collections on those sites. Um, but then we're also doing something like we have a scavenger hunt. Um, and this year we'll be doing it on Harlem and East Harlem and really getting um, our visitors outside to be able to participate um, in the neighborhoods of Harlem and East Harlem together in a socially distanced and pandemic uh, safe environment. Um, and then being able to come back to the museum um, with all with their answers to their scavenger hunt. So I think there's an interesting um, relationship where we can go out more into the city City, but then also bring the city voices inside of our building. Thank you, Sharon. Um, all of that, I mean, we, we really are, uh, as I showed in my side, we aim to be the shared space in the middle of it all, in the middle of the joy, in the middle of the awfulness that a big city can be, in the middle of uh, people's lives, in the middle of contentious issues, um, and that really takes us back in time and forward in time. So what I want, uh, and I think city museums have this really important role to play, which is about kind of helping people understand the place in which they live. And if they feel that they can understand it, change it, uh, influence it by understanding it, then um, that's job done for me. Um, I, I don't want people to love London because they've been to the Museum of London. I want people to understand London more. And certainly we talk about rich, complex ideas. And I think this is the age of complexity. And if museums were ever needed, they're needed now. It's not when politicians tell us we tell, tell people one thing or the other. We have to be based on evidence, and in my case, using the material culture around London. And it's hugely important. And that's the, that's the, um, the big challenge for museums going forward. And it's something we bear very, very closely and strongly and with lots of integrity. Uh, we've we've only got a couple of minutes. We've got some great questions here. Um, so a, a quick throw out, uh, Sharon, what technology technologies and exhibits do you have that will need to be readdressed because of COVID uh, in the museum? Is that something that you're going to have to change that you already have and that you're going to have to rethink of? All of our touch screens and everything like that have been changed, uh, but we need to think differently about them. Whitney, do you have the same issue? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, we need to think about as we design future um, gallery spaces, some of the assumptions of how we've built things in the past um, will have to change, absolutely. Awesome. Um, so Elat addressed that when she was talking uh, earlier. I have another question here. Um, what insights into interpretation and the provenance of collections have the expression of feeling shown by the Black Lives Matter protest. What what has that thrown up? Um, Whitney, if you can just address that from New York. Sure. Uh, we had already we had installed in 2018 um, a, a 
an installation on Black Lives Matter, which we, of course, um, updated after many of the protests this summer. Um, so it's, I think the issue of racial justice um, and where we fare um, is something that we're, we talk about um, almost on a daily basis for our programming and thinking about who's on staff here, um, how we can do better, who are the um, people, are the consultants, the volunteers, every aspect that we touch, making sure that it looks more like the city of New York and that we have more voices included. Um, and we've done a lot of programming around um, policing and safety um, and how communities of color have felt. Um, so it's something that we um, feel very strongly about and hope to be able to have an active dialogue on showing people the history of the racism that's exists in the city and then talking about our aspirations for ways that we can all attempt to improve the city. Thank you. Sharon, do you have a moment to answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, very much like um, Whitney, you know, it's embedded across the whole organisation. And, you know, when you have, have, have a, the collection of a diverse city, it's absolutely incumbent on you to make sure that that, that, that community and is represented. But we have another museum in Docklands in which we have a specific gallery called the Sugar and Slavery Gallery, which is really critical around discourse to do with um, uh, the, the transatlantic slave trade and the legacy and how the UK benefited from that. So that's a really, and that and is very important at this moment in time. And particularly as um, a, um, uh, the, the statue of a well-known uh, slave trader, slave factor, was outside of our museum and, and has been removed. And that's part of the public discourse around this issue. Uh, uh, and it's just one small dimension amongst a, a kind of a, a multiplicity of things. Um, so, you know, it, but that gives us a real focus on a particular aspect of Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Eilat, I know that you deal with communities all the time. We, re we have run out of time, but Eilat, if you want to just say uh, in response to that, it is uh, a different um, conversation that we're dealing with here in Israel, uh, but in Jerusalem, a city of many, many communities, what would you like to say? Um, so we, we are trying to um, build, um, you know, program for visiting the city and meeting with the people and our series of tours in the city takes uh, our visitors to meet uh, and, and those communities in their homes and in the institutions, but together with that, of course, to create exhibitions about the communities of the city like the current exhibition, the musical exhibition about the Barnai family uh, that tells the story of um, one family from the Persian community of the city, or I can tell about the future exhibition of uh, 150 years to Mea Shearim in the first ultra Orthodox neighborhood out of the city world that uh, will be in um, 2024. Um, we are trying to show the different faces of, of Jerusalem and um, of course the rich um, um, communities and, and, and culture of the city. But of course, um, there's a tension between the need to talk about the past and to talk about um, the three narratives of the city and of course the story of, of of modern Jerusalem. So we are trying to find an extension to the museum and maybe to open a, um, a gallery um, inside uh, the city. Uh, we did it in uh, 2014. We actually um, uh, built kind of a street exhibition, um, the photographer exhibition, if you remember, in one of the main um, squares of, of Jerusalem, the David Kanye uh, Machne Yehuda market. And uh, we're happy to say that now it's, uh, it's a gallery um, for, for um, artists and photographers. And it was our idea actually. 
Um, so there's a lot of, um, of, of plans uh, for the future. And we hope, of course, to expand the um, activity and, and the exhibitions of the museum, not just inside the city walls, but to the um, other places in, in the historic city of Jerusalem. Well, we are over, we are over time and, and my microphone is, uh, is it okay now? There we go. Um, we, we are, as I said, we've come to overtime. It's been fascinating. It will be lovely to spend many more hours uh, listening to your stories. We hope that we'll be able to travel again very soon uh, so that we can visit you in London and New York. And we hope that everyone here that has joined us uh, from in Israel uh, and from abroad will soon be able to come to us. Uh, let me end by wishing everyone a Chag Sameach, a happy holiday. Uh, we have Passover, the Jewish festival of Passover starting at the end of next week. Uh, the following weekend is Easter weekend. And the following week after that is the month of when uh, Ramadan will start. So actually this year, all three major festivals that happen uh, from the, the religions of uh, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity uh, are celebrated hugely in Jerusalem are all happening in the month of April. Uh, and if you can't travel here right now uh, to enjoy these celebrations of uh, the, the different religions, then you can actually do so by coming to our website where we've got virtual programming and experiences that you can see from there. So Chag Sameach. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that we'll see you virtually and in person very soon. And I'll just let Elat finish this evening. I just want to thank you, Caroline, and thank uh, Rosgen Star for arranging these um, meetings and conversations. I want to thank uh, Sharon Whitney for joining us. And of course, uh, I would like to invite you as soon as possible to visit Jerusalem and the Tower of David. And thank you for all of you we're waiting for you here at the Tower of David. I um, hope to be able, as I said, to open the museum um, next year. So um, we are here and looking forward to see you. Thank you and um, good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.